It's a little bit longer today than sometimes, but I think it'll pass quickly. It's the story of Pentecost uh, in Acts chapter 2. You know, sometimes we Christian, particularly we preacher types, just assume everybody knows everything. Somebody said this morning, what is Pentecost? It's a good question. Um, But Pentecost is historically, it was a celebration that followed 50 days from another celebration. The Jews had specific times that they got together to do celebrations, and Pentecost was one of them, one of the feast times. And they were getting together for this regular, you know, get-together, when the Holy Spirit did something fresh and new. So let's look at the scripture with that in mind. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In Sunday school, a few moments ago, we were talking about two interesting things with regard to wind and fire. Those are both symbols of divine presence. Think about it in the scriptures. Burning bush, you know, breathe on me, breath of God. He breathed into us the breath of life. So, spirit, fire, symbols of divine presence. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they said, Are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us heard them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phalegra, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Aren't you glad I finally got through those names? <laughs> So am I. Anyway, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. You know what that really should better read? Notice that. Uh, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and bystanders. Street people. People who were just there. Cretans, Arabs, we heard them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. Amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made much fun of them, saying they have had too much wine to drink. This is a passage I've loved. We've talked about this. Peter says, couldn't possibly be. It's too early. Watch it. We'll see. (laughs) Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, addressed the crowd. That's what he said. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. See that exclamation point? See that? Um, No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. May God bless that reading from his heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. They were a very dissolute crew. They didn't have much energy. They didn't have much purpose. They didn't have much direction. But about 120 people got together on this first Pentecost a long time ago in another world away. They thought they'd run through the celebration of one of the old feasts and that would be it. But what happened to them was something very special and very unique. They ran into the full-blown power of the God who can be present and make everything new. Of the God who can be present and make everything different. Of the God, the God of life who can take even the most dissolute and divided and purposeless group and make of them some mighty witness for the living God. It's an old story that I love to tell, but my very best friend, Penny, um, we've known each other since we were about eight years old, Penny Cole, Harvey Penfield Cole, been married for about 40-something years to a girl that we all call Muggs. It's really bad to call something that pretty by that name, but anyway, it works, you know, Muggs. Um, But uh, when we were kids one time, we had gone to town on the streetcar when we were living in New Orleans in the city, and uh, on the way down, I think we're going to go to the movie or something. Uh, we passed this car lot, and here was this green Lincoln Continental. And uh, one of those ones where the front door's open like this, and, you know, the back door's open like that. you remember that? Uh, oh, it's a pretty car. And it was $5.95. Now, 
marked on the windshield, special sale today, $5.95. So we got out of the streetcar. And we went to that lot, and we looked at that thing. What didn't uh, had new tires on it, didn't have a dent, was shiny, was wonderful. We looked around, so Penny, he's kind of the aggressive type, and he goes to the house and says, I want to test drive this car. And the man said, no. And Penny said, well, I want to test drive this car. He said, I've got that much money, and I want to take it for a ride, and I want to uh, see how it is. And the man said, no, can't. And Penny said, why? And he said, well, it doesn't have a motor. It's got everything but the engine blew and we had to pull the engine and that's why it's so cheap. <laughs> Somehow or the other, that'll work for Pentecost. Because sometimes we have all of the outward form of religion but not the power. We know how to go through the routine. We know what to do and when to do it. But sometimes we don't have that God-given, full of the Spirit power. And so that's what Pentecost is about. To whom does God give this power? He gives it to all who will receive it. What's interesting about this passage of Scripture is that every nation known on earth is present. I've read that in more than one commentary. That all of those names that are not easy to pronounce represent all of the people that existed at that particular time that were known to them. So that civilization has pretty much come together for this period of feast, and religious practice. But in this particular place, when the Holy Spirit comes, they're all present. Somebody said just this morning, I was listening to the radio show, and you said something to the effect that God's salvation is available equally to all men and women everywhere. And what we were talking about was that God equally loves and desires a relationship with all men and women everywhere. The truth is that that's not an altogether accurate statement because some people have not yet heard about the God of grace, about the God of mercy, about the God of love in Christ Jesus, our Savior. They have not heard that word yet, and so we need to begin to live and to speak and to reach out and to offer in acceptable and meaningful ways this word that God has given to us. But Pentecost is for all of God's children and not just for some. I hope you know how powerful a word that is and how important a statement that is. Because there are many, many men and women, and some few of them may be actually sitting in this space on this day who think that God is the God who loves some but does not love all. God is the God who loves all. Those whom God hath made, God loves and calls to his own heart and to his own soul. What then is Pentecost? if it's for all of God's children. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's filling up the empty spiritual spaces in your life and mine. Some brothers and sisters say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit can only be confirmed with tongues, with speaking in tongues. Some of you have heard that. Not long ago I took, well it is long ago now, but I took one of the youth groups to a Pentecostal church. God bless all of the people of God. You know, I'm thankful to be a part of a church that doesn't have to put down other people's churches. Lift up Christ, lift up God, and do your business. Anyway, my kids just loved it because a little lady in front of them began to open a purse up and hand back, uh, uh, I was going to say tangerines, <laughs> tambourines, triangles, um, began to hand back uh, cymbals. Uh, drumsticks that you could beat on the hymnal. You'd be surprised at how you can play drums on the hymnal. Da, da, boom, dap, you know, like a, so we were having a great time just singing and all that kind of stuff. And then they begin to pray in concert. Have you ever heard that? Uh, when you pray in concert, what happens is I'll say, let's pray in concert. And everybody begins to pray out loud, each person praying their own prayer. And so you have a whole number of people doing that. And some people are praying in tongues. They're praying in tongues. You know, some kind of ecstatic spirit. All of that is a part of religious practice that many people enjoy and find meaningful. That is not what happened on Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost was that there was a miracle of hearing and understanding. These people all said, we understand what's being said. We hear in our own language. What do you suppose they heard? What do you suppose they understood? That God is the God of all. That God's love is for all. That God's salvation is for all who will receive it, see? And so what it is is, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is to be filled with the love of God that we see in Jesus our Savior. It's to begin to have the Spirit of Christ. It's to begin to have God's loving Spirit in your own life. I don't care what kind of religious experience you have had. I don't care about what kind of religious practice you prefer. 
If you don't bear the spirit of the love of God and the compassion and mercy of Christ, then you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't have to be loud or sassy. It might be very soft and subtle. The thing that keeps on amazing me about God is how God uses your kind of person and personality to get the job done. So that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is our being filled with the grace of God, with the love of God. It's the Spirit of God witnessing to your spirit and to my spirit that you're a child of God. Listen to me now. It is your spirit being witnessed to by the Holy Spirit of God that you're a child of God right now, right here. God and the Holy Spirit wants you to feel that. That touch of the divine, that baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the question then is when? When does this happen? Well, it happens when you're ready for it. It happens when you're willing to receive it. You might say, well, I'm willing to receive it. No, you're not. Not every time, because suppose willing to receive it meant that you'd have to change some of your ways. I always say, God, I love you a whole lot. Change me later. You ever been there? But when you are truly willing to receive it, when you're truly willing to be open, God will not withhold from you any good or perfect gift. So when you come to the place that you say, God, I really now am ready to let you do what you do best. Fill me. And then God can show you what God's capable of doing I love to tell this story. Wallace Roberts is in heaven now. He died several years ago. But Wallace had been invited to Meridian to preach a big-time revival. They had it at the Majestic Theater. Isn't that the name of that big theater over there, the Majestic? Anyway, it had elevators and everything. And he said he never had preached in a place where they had elevators, and he was really impressed. And um, they told him he could go upstairs, that they had a little room set aside for him, and he could go upstairs, and that he could pray for a few minutes before he preached, and that they'd come get him. When he got on the elevator, there was a guy that was dead drunk on the elevator. He was over in the corner, and he couldn't stand up. He was on about a 90-degree angle, but he kept on staring at Wallace. And Wallace said it was very uncomfortable when you were the only two people on board the elevator, (laughs) you know. And so when they were about halfway up, he said, that was the slowest elevator in the history of elevating. He said this man looked at him and said, aren't you the Reverend Wallace Roberts, that eminent preacher? And Wallace said, well... I'm Wallace Roberts. I'm not so eminent. And he said, oh, Brother Wallace, he said it was you that converted me. (laughs) He said, you did so much good. You know, anyway, when Wallace told us about that later, he said, you know, if God doesn't convert us, doesn't do much good anyway, you know. And it doesn't mean that that man did not give his heart to Jesus somewhere along the way. It just meant that the salvation experience was not completed yet. You've got to go from one place to another, and you've got to go from a kind of sickness toward a kind of health, but it's whenever you're willing to receive it. And then finally, last but not least, where? What and when and where? Right here, right now. We had a little lady named Jerry Gadsden in our youth group, and um, Jerry never would pray out loud when the kids would pray. She was the cook at first and later became one of the associate directors. And they said, "Um, why don't you ever pray? And she said, I'm scared to pray, especially out loud. And then they said, why don't you pray? And she said, because I'm not as educated as you all are. They were a very educated group of kids. And she said, I won't sound as educated as you. And the kids said, we don't care. We just want you to pray what God puts it on your heart, what God puts on your heart. And when God puts something on your heart, will you promise you'll pray it out loud? She said, when God puts it on my heart, I'll pray out loud. And one night there was a long pause in the prayer. And Jerry Gadsden's voice very distinctly said, God, This is my first out loud prayer. But I feel moved by your spirit to pray it. I feel full of your love. And so what I'm asking is this, that you take this group and you start with us and you make a better world right here, right now. Amen. I haven't forgotten that one for a long time. Dr. Norman Perrin was my teacher of New Testament. Dr. Perrin was from just outside of London, a small town. This is what he used to say. Beloved, the kingdom of God is when and where God is king. Whenever and wherever. I'm trying to get that. And wherever God is king, there is the kingdom of God. Listen to me. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is whenever 
and wherever you say, God, I'm empty, fill me up. God, I'm needy, meet my needs. God, I'm willing, touch my heart. God, I'm open, fill me to overflowing. It was a beautiful four-door green Lincoln Continental. It just didn't have a motor. Some of us are beautiful, but we need the engine that moves the vessel. God, give us that Pentecost. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, sometimes we know it and feel it and receive it, and sometimes we're close. And sometimes we preachers, we give our best shot. And every now and then you baptize the words and use them to bless your people. And every now and then we say, well, there's always another Sunday. God, thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your patience. And thank you for this Sunday, which we call Pentecost. As you took that first 120 Christians or so and made of them a people that have endured for the thousands of years that have passed, take this small group of men and women and make us, by your Spirit, representatives of your love and Spirit in the days which are to come. Through Christ, amen.